Lord of earth. We thank you. We thank you for allowing us to continue to stand on you. We thank you for allowing us all of the fruits, all of the many bountiful things that you give us every single day. We thank you for forgiveness, dear mother. We thank you for forgiving us for all that we do, consciously and unconsciously sometimes, to hurt you. We disrespect you. Dear Mother Earth, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for not giving up on us and for helping us to not give up on ourselves and for teaching us every day to forgive. Thank you, dear Mother. Thank you.
so thrilled to have you here. Aisha is a friend and someone that I've been circling and in circles with for quite a long time. And we always, we gotta get together. We gotta do some work together. And you know, that's a familiar conversation that you have over and over and over again. And uh, the time is always right when the work is righteous. Uh, and I know your work to be brilliant and righteous. And so on behalf of uh, you're here, I know that you are also associated with brilliant, righteous, and needed work. Um, I'm also the sound guy, so I'm going to get this together when I get off the stage. <laughs> I'm going to make my remarks really quick. Hello to all the partners in the room, the Way University of Pennsylvania. Uh, for those of you who have been coming here since our opening in 1976, for those of you who are here for the first time, the African American Museum is about the righteous black work, about preserving our history, our stories, our culture. You look around and you see a hundred uh, black folk who are associated here in Philadelphia, an exhibition that we curated that was at the uh, airport, right? So like thousands and millions of visitors saw these images. And so these are the stories that we tell. These are the people that are part of our legacy. Uh, right now we have an amazing exhibition upstairs that you want to see. Uh, Mufa, who was a, a journal of black women photographers. Mm -hmm. Layla and Delphine have curated a show of over 50 black women and non-binary photographers expanding the dialogue and the story around black masculinity. Decentering it from uh, cis straight men, and bringing in trans voices, bringing in all kinds of voices that are uh, kind of part of that story about black masculinity and black lives. And so it's gorgeous, it's stunning. It's here until February. Uh, check out our website. There's lots going on. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all that you do to make this world better. Thank you. So war has been around since 71, now it's not time for the commercial, right? So war has been around. 
And she was just like, let's see what we can do. And, um, and so just really want to just acknowledge that. And then to be able to meet Brittany, because at that point, Brittany hadn't come on board. Um, and she was like, let's wait till Brittany comes on board and so to be able to meet and work with Brittany. So just, you know, and the, particularly on this day of when the film Harriet opens, just want to talk about the sister underground network, the, as Tony K. Bambara and Morrison, Tony K. Bambara and Tony Morrison, had this Black Women Don't Walk on Water Club where they would send each other checks um, in the mail back when they were um, very struggling in the early days. And so just really want to acknowledge it. There's so many examples of that, but I wanted to acknowledge that. So this next section, let me just say, was not originally on the program, and I have to give all credit to Thea Matthews for it, um, in terms of just lifting some of the voices, poetic voices, in the anthology. And so I will, um, we'll hear from three poets who will do um, one poem each. And the first one is Sister Tanisha Esperanza Jarvis, who I met last year um, at Elvia, which is a, uh, happens on July 25th, and it is celebrating and recognizing the, um, the Afro diasporic woman in the Americas, in South America and the Caribbean. Um, and Luz Marcus Minlo, who is also a JBC fellow, she has been, she, for this is the third year, we've been organizing this truly diasporic international gathering, really reminding us that blackness is not just an African American thing. And so, Tanisha Esperanza Jarvis, who is a bisexual Afro Latina healer, activist, and psychology student, was at um, LDA last year. She was proudly wearing her Spellman shirt. <laughs> My partner, Sheila Alexander Reed, who is also a Spellman, was <laughs> 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 Spellman! <laughs> 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 we've all been interconnected. So it's quite possible that if Tanisha hadn't worn the shirt, I mean, she, we would have been in the conference, but we might not have had that connection. And actually, it's, it's in, in Sheila, because Sheila is. She, as everybody knows, who knows Sheila, she makes herself known and she is also makes you known. So, <laughs> so Tanisha, please come up. Bless the mic. art, 
to knowledge and whatever gifts the universe bestows upon you. And as you open your eyes, let's affirm, Ashe. Ashe. Into a thing to be hated, and now she is all alone. Mm -hmm. 
Her friends and family have turned their back. She's a prisoner in her own home. She ain't got no money. She can't call for help because he didn't took her phone. Our silence fertilizes the fields where fear and shame have grown because we're supposed to be there to catch her. No matter how many times she trips, we should be there to comfort her for ice on bruised eyes and lips. She should be able to lean on us if ever her backbone should slip or stand in the earth for a little while when she begins to lose her grip. But she was tough. She was a wild girl, some folks used to say. She looked 50 when she was 20, but she was pretty in her own way. And though you couldn't see the rain as it drenched her, her skies were always gray. She never thought she'd make it to any tomorrow, but always found a way. She was a hustler. Oh. Smooth on the outside with pain bursting at a seam. She thought she was a crash site. She never learned how to dream. And good loving always proved to be much further away than it seemed. Sometimes she laughed out loud for no reason, just to mute a pierce and scream. They called her wild girl. But they always looked at her with the wrong eyes because it was her honesty that burned their skin inside. These ghettos filled with lies and open wounds will still be heavy, no matter what the disguise. Her madness is a social painting that girls are nurtured to despise. She was a hustler. Oh, Getting to the next bed, the next meal, finding some relief from hell. She was born inside the coffin and weeping, hammering in the nails. And thus the story of her life is an alternate wicked tale about brown girls who been locked up for bullshit. They cannot afford the bail. And there's nobody left out here who's going to hug that lady's children. Yes. Nobody cares enough to ask them what they might be feeling. And a child with no mama suffers a cruel and vicious killing. Somebody's going to find her hanging from a sturdy ceiling or running from here to there with a the hug and nobody can feed it. They won't let her touch her mama through that glass no matter how much she needs it. There's a struggle going on inside her soul. Maybe she ain't grown enough to leave it. So many pamphlets on pain and survival, but nobody even asked if she could read it. And I'm not immune because I was taught that sister was so much lower than me. But it was easy for me to pretend she was different. See, she never made me feel free. But I didn't know I was supposed to use my strength to cut her down from the trees, to stand for her and put arms around her because whoever she is, that's who I be. And I go along with the world sometimes when they try to tell me that you're invisible and their urge to stand taller than you, it is still so irresistible. But you see, the vines on which we all grow, they are all so twistable, and I got to structure my life so you not survive. It makes my life unlivable. Because you and I, we're both different strands of the very same rope. We both teeter right here in the crack between death and hope. We're overdosing on shame, sex, disease, jail, and dope. Our bodies have been beat, kicked, raped, mutilated, sterilized, and broke. We are all suffering. We just got different ways that we might cope. Now some sisters will cry that shit out, live to fight another day. Some sisters hold it all in, they tell you to fight and all they say. Some sisters say, hey, you gonna use me anyway? The motherfucker, you gonna pay. Mm -hmm. Some sisters write, some sisters drum, some sisters got to pray, some sisters out here risking their lives to see the danger of women and girls. Mm -hmm. You know, she left one night with blood on cotton sheets. She was tired of trying to find the light that we say shines on darkened streets. She was tired of trying to walk around here looking normal and talk to broken feet. She thought she lost too many pieces of herself to ever really feel complete. She had nightmares about dudes brushing her soul's threshold and lights out. She was drowning and could not find the energy to flail her arms and shout. She didn't want to meet no more preachers, didn't seem to know what God was all about. Right. She tried to do it all by the book. She tried your good girl route. Mm -hmm. And it ain't no use in us crying tears for her now, because she is already gone. Mm -hmm. And it ain't going to ease nobody but me to write her a goodbye song, but she left other siblings behind. Other siblings just having to be strong, and maybe I don't know you, maybe I don't see you, maybe everything I think about you is wrong. But in your very existence, you beg the question of me all day long about the kind of sister it is that I'm trying to be. Does standing on another sister's fractured back, does that make me feel free? Neither I'm gonna stand for black girls, or I'm gonna hang y'all from trees, and I don't trust myself sometimes because of ones I need to but I want to die trying to be the vision of my mother's dream city. But what about y'all? What kind of siblings is it that y'all are really trying to be? Point.
Kelly was working on a thesis project. Um, at, he is from San Francisco, and she was a student at uh, UC Berkeley, and interviewed me uh, around sexual violence um, and around sexual violence. I remember just the conversation. And so this was three years ago, maybe four years ago. And then I did the Love and Accountability Forum, which was an online forum on the Feminist Wire, which is from which the anthology and um, I invited Thea to contribute uh, to the forum, and she did. And then when I knew that I was going to do the anthology, I circled back and said, did you contribute to the anthology? And she did, and I'm very glad that she did. And so I have just gotten to know her through the virtual ways, through social media, and through being in touch around the anthology. So I just met Thea for the first time yesterday, in person. Um, but through the emails, Thea asked around having poets uh, speak at, at this evening. And I was just like, I'm going crazy. Do you know what I'm doing? <laughs> 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 Asian dishes, 
and great white sharks with porcelain white smiles. I turn her on her side, pat her back as she coughs at the debris. Instantly, our battles to live thaw with the sun on her fingertips. The stars blown for wishes, the crown of light, her black frizzled curls mold, resembling the moon of a dandelion. And this last poem I'll close with is featured in the anthology, Alicia, I love you. Lilacs, letter, letter to my grandfather. Take your filthy hands off me. I said, take your scarred, wounded hands off me. Your weight has no power over my wobbly toddler knees. Your old construction hands calloused for generations of incest, beatings, children screaming, pulverized my amethyst flowers. How could you? I remember choking on the sighs of your retired labor union tongue when my gums were getting ready to release their first set of baby teeth. I remember you stretching my legs after kindergarten graduation. I stopped back from school then, my tights stained, a rite of passage to the first grade. I remember. You spreading my legs at night when Grandma went to take a long bath. Your oldest son pulled the same move, like father, like son, two years later. His gallant badge radiated from extinguishing fires. Your son, this firefighter, used his hands to burn the lips between my thighs. I remember. I survived. A field of lilacs who runs with the four directions. The great spirit oversees this field. I clear out my throat each time I taste your mucoid saliva. I lose my appetite when I feel your fingers circling my soft areolas. I smudge my body with sage, sweet grass, rose petals, transmuting your residual sweat into tears leading me to the ocean. I scream into waves, Yemaya holds me. The shoreline salty foam releases my prayers. I dive deep. Soar high, unwind on the spine of a humpback whale. Her oscillating muffled words travel miles. Her cryptic tones swirl violet within my aura. I declare, you have no power over me. You have no power over me. You have no power over me. When dawn breaks, I rise in the direction of the east. I pick up shovel and seeds. I sow, I weep, I sow, I weep, I sow, I weep. For many moons, I renew an ethereal field of lilacs. Swallowtail butterflies rest on petals, pulsating corporeal shades of violet. Leaves dance while oak trees wave their arms in celebration. At last, I return. I return to where I first saw her where I first see me as a little girl, and where I tell her, I love you. I've always loved you. And I never left you. I never will leave you. She roams in this field. She rests in power. Thank you. Yes.
very clear. When I say this, I'm starting with these three, but there are, I, I think, 27 contributors. And I want to do a roll call. I'm very um, 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 drained. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I want to do a roll call. I'm not able to kind of like do the bios um, at, at this moment. And I really do apologize. But this is why you have to get the book. Yeah. So yeah. you can read the bios and read the board words. But I really, I'm just going to call the, the role of the contributors who are here and ask them to stand. Because what, what these courageous individuals did in, in record time, I mean, I signed the contract with um, AK Press in May of 2018, mm -hmm. and I submitted the draft November 1st. Oh. And while several of them worked from pieces that they already contributed in 20, in, 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 during the Love of the Accountability Forum, most reworked, re-edited, thought about. And they can all attest to all of my emails. Hi, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm really glad you couldn't hear behind the screen. But I, <laughs> but I just really want to lift these folks because what they've done, and this is I, and I'm, it's, 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 this is groundbreaking work. And I'm not, I mean, I am an editor, but it is groundbreaking in terms of really the voices of diaspora, black, people, cis, trans, queer, straight, gender non-binary, African-American, Latinx, African, um, Caribbean, indigenous, that we all come together to not only talk about violence that we've experienced, but to begin to envision how do we disrupt and end it without relying on the state, yeah. right. without relying on the state that has yeah. Yeah. destroyed our communities. Yeah. And not only our communities in the US, in the Caribbean, in South America, how colonialism has impacted the, uh, the continent. So really talking about it. And so often, most of us, when we talk about the sexual violence that we experience, we always get met with well, one of two things. It's like either, well, you need to lock them up and throw away the key, or, well, you can't say anything because you know that the police are killing us. And so we're caught between a rock and a hard place. And so what this anthology is saying is that we have to learn how to hold both hands. It is horrible, the state is horrible, but we've got to figure out a way forward so that we can end this epidemic. Yes. yes. So I'm here. So the world Ms. Alexander, please stand for the graduation. I saw this. All right, we'll come back. Esther Amon.
Emergent Fund. of ancestral work 
that has happened to heal like our ancestors before us and the futures to come. So I'm so grateful for your leadership and your vision and your work. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for allowing us to co-create this space with you. We're so grateful. Um, so I'll, yes. <laughs> So I just want to ground myself in like who I am first. So I, um, like I said, DCRCC and Insight um, were my political homes. I'm a queer, Afro-Puerto Rican survivor of child sexual abuse and practicing, in the words of Amita, child sexual um, abuse, but also childhood rape. Um, also family, domestic violence, also adult sexual assault. Um, I am the granddaughter and great-granddaughter of black domestic workers from Latin America working in Miami, Florida and white people's houses. I'm a social worker who learned pretty early on that um, the systems of social work, including foster care, policing, prisons, um, detention, deportation, all of ICE, shelter systems, labor, um, and all of policing would never keep us safe. Um, and so I come to this work both as a survivor as a person who's worked in mainstream, many multiple mainstream organizations, and pretty quickly through study, through practice, through learning, and through my own experience of child sexual abuse, um, knew that we needed other options. Right? I knew that the police were not the first place that we called when we were in danger, we called one another. There's actually data to, to prove that too. Um, that we are more likely to call our friends, we are more likely to call our church members, we are more likely to call our aunts and our sisters when harm occurs, right? Um, sometimes that's us, right? So part of our work around how we interrupt sexual abuse is like, are we ready? Are we ready to get the call? And what do we do then? So I want to talk a little bit, um, a little bit about that. Mm. So I have worked, like I said, in multiple mainstream kind of rape crisis centers, domestic violence shelters, often led by white women, often led by straight folks, um, often led by folks who weren't immigrants and weren't thinking about the implications or risks of deportation on our families, or the risk of policing or criminalization on our families. Um, and I knew that there had to be another way, and I know that there are lots of people who are doing work around transformative justice, from the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective, to um, folks who are working in New York right now to incubate a New York Transformative Justice Hub. There are lots of folks who are thinking about this. And I think for black folks in particular, when we talk about the harm of policing and jails, people can get behind that. We're like, yeah, yeah, police, bad, jail, bad. Oh, but what about rapists? Right? Oh, but what about domestic violence, right? And um, and so I think that it, we need to practice, right? Um, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what it means to create solutions outside of the state because I haven't seen them. I'm afraid of what it means to create solutions outside of the state because we haven't practiced with one another. I don't even know that I could call my neighbors now to keep me safe. Will I be able to call them when I'm experiencing family violence? Will I be able to call them when children are being abused, right? And so for me, the work has really been about practicing, and I get it that we're scared. Um, and I understand that the stakes are very high. Half of all women are murdered by an intimate partner, um, and many of them, most of them are black, right? Um, 24 black trans women have been murdered this year, I, as we were naming um, folks that we wanted to call in the room. I called in Ashanti Carmen in DC, who died this year, who was murdered this year. I called in Zoe Spears, who was murdered this year. I called in Lily Polanco, who died in Rikers Jail this year. Um, and so I'm very aware that um, it is a risk, right, to create solutions outside of the criminal legal system, but I think what's more risky is continuing to invest in a system that has continuously done us harm, that comes out of slave codes, that comes out of coercion and trying to um, keep us in line. And so um, at my previous organization, Collective Action for Safe Spaces in Washington, D.C., which is a small grassroots organization doing work around the intersections of intimate partner violence and state violence, 
Um, we are incubating a transformative justice collective in Washington, D.C. that is led by queer and trans people of color uh, that is uh, giving folks the tools to practice what it looks like to create accountability circles. So, um, you know, when I think about love with accountability, you know, we're saying no jails, but we're not saying no accountability, right? right? Um, I think that part of what makes people afraid of engaging with these processes is that for so long we've seen um, accountability as the same as punishment. We've seen um, accountability as this very punitive way of revenge, right? Um, and what, what, what we know about survivors, what they're asking for, is they want behaviors to change. They want the abuse to stop. They want people to be held accountable, but we don't want to see our loved ones locked up. Um, for me, as a survivor of child sexual abuse, um, who was sexually abused by my brother um, for, many, for many years, um, I knew in our community that we were black, right? We were Afro-Latinx, we were immigrants, um, we were working class, and I knew, I understood very early on the risk of what it meant to tell. Um, I, I understood the risk of what it meant to tell and engage with the criminal legal system or foster care. Um, I knew that the stakes were very high. I did not tell. Um, and part of that is because survivors are often, particularly those of us who are survivors of child sexual abuse, are negotiating this balance between telling our stories and losing our family telling our stories and losing our networks of care, our communities of origin, or speaking our truth, right? And um, that's, a, that's a decision that no child should have to make. Um, that's a decision that survivors shouldn't have to make. And so, um, so there are a couple of, I just want to explain some resources. Yeah, okay. She's like, move it along, Alicia. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, there are, um, there are a couple of um, interventions, like creative interventions. There's a new book called Bumbling Towards Repair. Um, I really encourage you, if you're thinking about what it looks like to create solutions outside of the police or outside of the criminal legal system, to create a reading group for your community. Create a reading group for your neighborhood. Um, you know, again, this is a practice, and we haven't seen it before. It's all Afrofuturism. Right? It's all science fiction. We're all imagining, we're all visioning a world that we are breathing into life that doesn't exist yet. Um, and so I really encourage you to like work with your neighbors. Wait, first of all, do you even know your neighbors? Yes. So like, know, know your neighbors, maybe? Um, and start to practice what it looks like to create solutions outside.
chapter correct. It's the compassion imperative from hurt to healing a new north. Mm -hmm. And it is from a talk, keynote lecture that he gave at Angola prison mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. um, to incarcerated uh, <coughs> black men, a uh, predominantly black men, I'm assuming we know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and, it's, and when, I, when I asked him to contribute and he shared it, I, and his piece, I said, oh no, yes, we have to publish it. Uh -huh. So Mel, and, and also it's very important because you know we've been talking a lot about women and why we predominantly meeting cis women, including trans women, when people are remembering, right? And so we have to continue to remember, yeah. and then also remember that one in six uh, cis men will be abused in their lifetime. Yeah. And so, Mel, please speak. Thank you so much. Um, good to be here. I, um, Aisha and I met several years ago to the Just Beginnings Collaborative, and um, a lot of folks talk about um, Aisha finding, I've, I've heard that as a theme throughout, and Aisha and I found each other, but she did find me in a space where I was really trying to not just broaden, but deepen my work. Um, for a long time, it was me against them. It's us against you. And my my work ethic as an advocate, I was very proud of it, but it was very one-sided and it took a long time for me to really see that. So, um, for me, compassion has been something I've been working on for the longest time. It took, as, as a man in the 70s and 80s growing up, you know, as a kid, I didn't, there weren't words for what happened. Um, there are only feelings, and the feelings that you felt were from television or people. It, it, um, yeah, it was just it was, it was a strange way to be. It took me a long time to get to the point of compassion, seeing what had happened to me, uh, realizing that it wasn't my fault. I'm eight. I'm eleven. There's nothing that I could have done then. So being on that compassion road was great for me. It allowed me to see myself as a fuller person and it also helped me see other people in a way that was fuller and truer than I'd ever done before, which when Aisha and I had met was at that real critical point when I really stepped into compassion, really stepped into it. I'm gonna see my brothers behind bars like I see my brothers in front of me, there should be no difference. And I don't know why that was for me for the longest time. I would fight for the right brother. But that rightness was what I felt was right. So it was, it was skewed. I had to get to a different place. So compassion got me to that place where I could see myself and see others in a very true way. And I liked living that way. I do like living that way. Meeting Aisha, though, with love with accountability, that's a level above. Mm -hmm. That 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 is a place that I didn't think existed. I never saw it. You can't be what you can't see. So until she brought that up, I never even thought that was even a thing. That's pretend. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think it could work for me. Certainly, I'm I'm here. Compassion is good. Compassion is a good place to stand for me because. It gives me everything that I need. I can be compassionate. I can want you to be healed. I can make some kind of action to make that happen, and it's all good. But love with accountability is not compassion. And in order to get to that love with accountability place, I think a lot of us, well, for me, I, could, I, I can't get to that place yet. I am not there yet, but through compassion, it's given me that window to see that I can step into that place. And with Aisha's help, and with my friends here, I get to reimagine what that looks like. So for me, compassion is a great place to be. If we all could live a compassionate life. Just compassion alone could change a lot. And I know that, but I also know 
if I'm really going to make change, I need to get on the other boat. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's wonderful to be with a friend. Not just a friend, with, with a visionary. With someone who is braver than me. And I say that honestly. I can be brave if I can see you be brave. So with Aisha's help and with compassion, I'm stepping into this place, this really difficult place where I have to see my brothers and sisters like they're my brothers and sisters. I don't want to see my sisters and brothers behind bars. I don't want to have to deny my father to save my mother. I want both. Love with accountability is that space. And I think I can get there. I think I can get there for anyone in this room who's like me, who's for years said, I can't, I can't forgive my perpetrator. There may be a way to do it. I'm there too. I was there. But I'm getting closer to this place of more grace. I'm getting closer to this place. For me, love with accountability is this real drawbridge to the rest of humanity. Love with accountability, I would say, it's a drawbridge between grief and grace. Being on that road can allow me to get there. Compassion gets me very close. I can see the problem, but I can't get over that bridge of love with accountability. But I think I can now. And it's, and it's a lovely place to be. Me, I think this book is probably one of the most important books I've ever read. Ms. Morrison would be so proud of this. It centers us without care of anybody else's feelings. It centers us. It speaks to us. And also, if others are lucky, it will inform and edify change. Art is what I do. An artist is what I am. I was hurt young, so I started to express myself at a young age. I didn't know what the words were, but if someone had read my art, they would have known that this boy has something that you might need to ask. He doesn't know the question, but maybe you can help him. It took nobody ever really noticed, but my artwork saved me. I am not a technical artist at all. I'm so proud of that because I get to do it however I want. I remember growing up thinking, how do I get this feeling outside of my body? It's raining, it's muddy outside, I'm seven years old. I make the biggest mask that I could find. I make the biggest face out of this mud hill. And it looks like the guy that I hate. Mouth caved open, eyes all sunk in, there it is humongous. And I loved punching it when I was done. Right? Art gave me freedom. I could make things out of nothing. I felt like nothing. But when I made a piece of art, I knew it was real. And so was I. Yes. So for me, I, my art, I find things. Like my friends and the people who love me found me. Like Aisha found me. I will find something and hold on to it until something else connects with it and it looks like love. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes a while. I take pieces that people throw away. I take things that people put in the trash and I put them together again just like people look at us sometimes. Mm -hmm. They look at us like we don't belong. What's that doing here? Mm -hmm. What's, what is that even? But you pick them up, you put them together, and you've got a sculpture that looks like this room. And it's powerful. It does things. We walked in this room and we heard a drum, and it changed the way I felt. I heard some poems tonight that will never leave my mind. There are photos on this wall right here of the people that look like us. We are inspired. Art 
does that, like nothing else. You want to make me happy? Say, Lizzo. <laughs> This is one of them. This is art. It's a work of art. It's a masterpiece. And Aisha was right. She didn't do it herself. It's a masterpiece from masters of the work, from people who mastered their hurt and turned it into healing, people who mastered their obstacles and turned them into inroads, turned them into places where we can help. Art does that. We wear t-shirts that say things that inspire us. Art does that. I love being able to do the work that I do, find a kid and say, let's just work it out. Let's work it out. Let's make something beautiful out of this ugly pain. Let's make something worthy. Let's make something that stands. Let's make something that lasts out of this thing that looks like nothing. If you can do that with cardboard, if you can do that with tin cans, inanimate objects, can you imagine what we could do together? We can change it. We can do it. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Tommy Morrison. <laughs> Lizzo. <laughs> and if I can just say with one, just one more thing. My art comes from my people. It comes from my bones. It comes from my marrow. It comes from my ancestors. It comes from the ages. And I get to hold it. My ancestors lived and died hundreds and hundreds of years ago just so I could do this. What a wonderful way to say, I love you, man. <laughs> so, Art Heels, thanks for allowing me to do it. Thanks for, <coughs> thanks for knowing that it works. Thanks for believing in it. And thanks for listening. <laughs>
So, um, and then he, and he says, this is the same person who terrorized me for two years, right? Um, so again, thinking about what Alicia said in terms of holding that dichotomy, right? It's not, how do we, how do we hold all of this? Um, and clearly, I, def I mean, I don't even think I was thinking about prison, particularly in my households, but I definitely would not have wanted to pop up to go to prison. Um, and so I, I share all this because both, well, let me just focus on that. Um, my mother, no, because I, you know, I don't want to, I didn't, yeah. <laughs> um, and so my mother is a human rights activist. She is a uh, survivor of sexual assault. And if you, many who saw no last night saw, um, heard her testimony um, and has dedicated her life for around women's rights, race rights, um, earth rights, just all rights, really. Um, and yet she did not protect me when I asked her. Um, cry for um, and, and uh, but I have to also say neither did my father because I don't want to act like you know there's one parent here and particularly as a feminist recognizing that she's a woman don't want to you know so neither one but we're talking about my mom so three years ago she um, came face to face with the reality that she didn't protect me because it, we had acknowledged that incest had happened so it wasn't like this was just some big revelation but what what she didn't recognize um, up until recently was how they not only just took me out of the situation, but that I engaged and was taught to love and, and spent a significant time with my grandparents um, while the abuse was happening. And the abuse stopped it after two years. I didn't get an announcement, but it did stop. Um, so I didn't know, so it's hindsight, but you know, so I never knew. The abuse stopped, but nothing was ever done. Nothing changed, holiday dinners, all of that. And so for my mom to really come to grips with that in 2016, um, was a very profound um, experience, and even equally as profound was her willingness to write about it publicly. So this right. wasn't just a private dialogue that she shared. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I mean, I've already heard and I've shared, you know, Instagram notes and stuff with people who said, I've read your mother's piece in the anthology, um, and I'm just so moved. Um, about, to, I've never seen a parent um, hold themselves accountable about not protecting their child. And we had the great fortune of being guests on Esther Ma's global podcast, The Spin, um, and so, which was really wonderful. And it's still online, you can hear it. Um, we, um, we recorded that. And as well as Luz Marquez Vimpo and um, Dr. Tamar Bryant Davis, they also were guests. It was a two part series. So I just wanted, because time's of the essence, and we want cell phones and sign. Um, just ask you, Mom, <laughs> to just please share about um, your work um, to uh, be accountable, privately and publicly. Okay. Well, first of all, <laughs> uh, it ain't easy. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, thank you, Aisha, for this amazing uh, two-day event uh, and I too have been able to see some of the behind the screen stuff so I know <laughs> I know how difficult it was to pull this off and so uh, I bow for yes, yes. the incredible The, um, when the scales fell from my eyes uh, in 2016, and Aisha has already shared uh, some aspects, let me just go back to when she was 10 years old. And she told me that Papa was coming into her room at night, and he was feeling her vagina. And I said, oh, no way. I'm Papa, are you kidding? I said, it's a bad dream. I'm not Papa. I mean, Papa brought us home from the hospital when she was born. Papa carried her in his arms into the house. She had always been around him. Uh, 
And I was kind of glad when uh, Loretta said uh, on an earlier panel, and this in no way excuses me, I was one of the ones not abused. And I did not know until I was in college, really, about people, uh, some of my friends that I made in college who had had brothers who sexually abused them and uncles and grandfathers. And I was in shock. And so let me just say that when Aisha said that to me, I, I didn't believe it. And this is a bad thing for a parent. And so this is one of the things that I say to a parent. If your child tells you they're being molested, believe them. Yes. Believe them. Yes. Uh, and so, it, you know, Aisha, I just kept saying, no, Papa wouldn't do anything like that. And so it was only because she kept saying it. And then she would cry, and I said, oh, my God. Maybe it's really true. So I did come to believe her, but then what do you do? And this uh, throws you into this horrible, horrible dilemma. So of course, Pop Pop, I didn't do anything. I told her dad, and he too didn't believe it, and then of course, I think finally did. He's not here to speak for himself, so I can't say what he believed. But I was made to believe that Pop Pop had been spoken to. So that does not in any way relieve me of the fact that I did nothing one on one, which I should have done. The other thing, and of course, after it stopped, Somehow or another, I pushed this to the back of my mind, not thinking, not being aware, not being sensitive to what Aisha was going through for the rest of her life. Because as she said, Thanksgiving was there, Christmas was there, Easter was there, parties, and Aisha stayed there when I was in Vietnam or wherever I was, Mexico, you know, working. And I don't know for the life of me how I did not know or think that even if she wasn't still being molested, the fear was there. She was in the same bedroom. He was in the same bedroom. It was so easy for it to start up again at any time. And that's what in 2016 I realized was all those years of her not knowing whether he was going to molest her, how we never changed in how we related to him, so what she saw was that it was okay. Pop Pop was still the man of the hour in our lives, or certainly in her grandmother's life, and the way we were acting in our lives. So this was what hit me in 2016. And I won't, you know, finally the three of us, Michael and myself and Aisha, had a discussion where Somehow or another, I finally woke up. And it was like, oh my God. Oh my God.
the love was always there. I think I would be able to Take some breaths and give folks a moment to feel their feelings. sexually assaulting her and my grandmother didn't believe it so you know it's like cycles you know yes. Yes. Well, I'm, yes. I am so grateful that we are breaking this This is some powerful healing work that you're witnessing. This is some powerful healing work that you're witnessing. Thank you for bearing witness to this moment. I'm all choked up, so um, I might ask that people just maybe stretch their arms, stretch, stand however you feel able to stand. Maybe stretch your arms, maybe reach your arms towards Aisha and Mama. And just let them know that this is not self-care, this is community care. Um, and that we're accountable to each other for our care. Thank you for modeling that with us right now. So thank you all for spending the last two days with us. I, I just have to say one thing before, before we head back aside. Um, survivors are so incredibly gracious. We are so patient with the, the process. We are so patient waiting for folks to believe us and affirm us and waiting for y'all to come around. We are so gracious. Um, so I just want to extend some grace to my survivor siblings in this space, particularly if you're black, particularly if you're queer and trans. I want to extend some grace to survivors of child sexual abuse right now. And then I'll ask that the folks who are in the book, okay. we're going to take a few minutes of a break. 
um, to get ourselves ready for the book signing. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, please buy books if you don't have one. Get your books if you um, have it in your purse, and we're going to move into a book signing. Thank y'all. Yeah.